One of the hallmarks of our sanctuary here at Broadmoor is the very large and colorful stained glass window that sits in the front and center of our church as you walk in. It contains various symbols from the life of Christ. We see a star signifying the star of Bethlehem that stood over the place where Jesus was born. And then in the central part of the window is the scene of the crucifixion. And of course, the panels in red are signifying the blood of Jesus shed as a sacrifice for our sins. Near the very top of the window, you might be able to make out a sun signifying the triumphant resurrection of Jesus Christ. So here in our west transept, the stained glass tells the story of creation. And up at the very top, you may be able to make out some angels as if they are looking down from the ramparts of heaven and a hand extending forth, again, representing the creation hand of God. In our east transept, the stained glass here depicts the sending of the Holy Spirit. And of course, here it's represented by a lovely white dove. So in total, these three windows represent the Trinity. God, the Father Creator, God, the Son, the one who came to earth as the man Jesus, and God, the Holy Spirit. I hope then that you have come to appreciate these windows not only as works of art, but as a testament to the works and the wonder of our great God. Well, good morning, and thank you for joining us on our contemporary online service this morning. We hope you've had a wonderful week. We're going to start off by singing a couple of songs, so I invite you to sing out with us at home. The greatest day in history, for death is beaten, you have rescued me. Sing it out, because Jesus is alive. The empty cross, the empty grave, but life eternal you have won the day. Shout it out, but Jesus is alive, and he's alive. And oh, happy day, happy day, for you wash my sin away. I stand in that place, free at last, meeting face to face. I am yours, and Jesus, you are mine. But in this joy and perfect peace, will earthly pain finally will see. Celebrate, because Jesus is alive, and he's alive. Day, happy day, and I 
glory is there. What glory is your way? And that you have saved me in the world glory is there. What glory is your name? And Jesus. Sing 
Hello. We've come to the time in our worship experience where we're going to pray together. Our topic today is about how God restores. So many times we um, have things in our life that we lose or uh, we feel that have been taken away from us. And our blessed assurance is that we can have the confidence that God is always replenishing us. I invite you to pray with me. Holy God, thank you for this time together. Thank you for the opportunity to, to Lord, just connect with you, our God, who throughout all of the ages has uh, been there for us and who has given us all that we need to this point. I ask you, God, that you would uh, impart uh, wisdom from today's message, Lord, that it may change our hearts, God, and that we may see you as a provider and that we may live in the joy of your abundance. I pray that all in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know how it happened. One day, a couple of weeks ago, I found myself watching one restoration video after the other. There's something captivating about watching a skilled craftsman take something that looks like a piece of junk and restoring it to something beautiful. From something like this to something like that. From this to this this to this. In almost all of the videos, the car or the tool or the piece of furniture has to be completely taken apart before it can be completely, properly repaired and restored to its former glory. Our scripture today is a passage uh, about God's promise to restore and make things beautiful, bring things that have fallen apart back to their former glory. There are words that resonate with me today given everything that's going on in our country. And I'm sure they'll resonate with you as well because they remind us that our God is a God of restoration. Let's pray together and ask God to help us listen for his word today. Oh God, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today, for we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Our scripture passage is Amos chapter 9, verses 14 and 15. Amos God, speaking through the prophet Amos, says this, I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild their ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. They shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them upon the land, and they shall never again be plucked up out of the land that I have given them, says the Lord your God. They're beautiful words of restoration and hope. But if we listen carefully, we can see that they are words that also hint at the process, take a process of taking something apart so that it can be repaired and restored. The, the verse says, ruined cities will be restored, and people who have been plucked up out of their land will be returned to it. Well, that raises a question. Why were the cities ruined in the first place? What caused the people to be plucked up out of their land? To understand the promise of restoration found in the last few verses of the prophet Amos, we need to have a basic understanding of the book as a whole. 
this week, uh, the Bible Project helped me to get reacquainted with the totality of the Amos story. Now, Amos, Amos was a shepherd and a fig tree farmer from Tekoa, a town just south of the border between the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, Israel had broken away from Judah about 150 years before Amos' time and now was being ruled by a king named Jeroboam II. Under Jeroboam's leadership, Israel grew in economic might and military strength. And while that might sound great, economic growth and military might are not the measurements that matter to God. From Genesis all the way through Revelation, the standard God uses to judge nations and rulers is not economic growth or military might. God's standard all the way through the Bible is justice and righteousness. In the eyes of Israel's elite, Jeroboam had made Israel great again. But in the eyes of the prophets, Jeroboam was one of the worst kings ever. He was one of the worst kings because Jeroboam allowed the worship of idols to flourish. And wherever idolatry flourishes, injustice grows as well. So Amos is called by God to go to Bethel, an important city with a large temple, and start announcing God's word to the people. What we call the book of Amos is a collection of his sermons and poems and visions. And because they are God's words, we can trust that they are not only words once spoken to people of Amos' day, they are also God's words spoken to us today for our time. Now, the book of Amos has a pretty simple structure. Chapters 1 and 2 is a message to the nations and to Israel. Chapters 3 through 6 are a collection of, of poems expressing God's message to the people of Israel and its leaders. Chapters 7 through 9 contain a series of visions that depict God's coming judgment against Israel. Now the book begins with a series of accusations against Israel's neighbors. And this may seem a little odd until you look at a map and realize what Amos has done. The way Amos orders, uh, names Israel's neighbors, effectively draws a series of concentric circles that puts Israel right at the center. He's essentially drawn a target and placed Israel in the bullseye. When he finally names Israel, he unleashes a denunciation that is over three times as long and way more intense than the accusations made against the other nations. Amos accuses Israel's wealthy of ignoring the poor and allowing unchecked growth of grave injustice in the land. Specifically, specifically he accuses them of forcing the poor to sell themselves into debt slavery and then denying them legal representation and protection. And this, Amos asked, is this the family that was once denied justice and enslaved in Egypt? Is this any way for the people of God, rescued from oppression and slavery, to act? God cannot ignore this any longer. Time's up. Judgment is coming. Chapters 3 through 6 explain why. Uh, Amos 3, 2 reads, You only have I known all the families of the earth. Now this is an allusion to Genesis 12 where God made a covenant with Abraham and promised that his descendants would be a blessing to the whole world. You only have I known of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your iniquities. Israel had a great calling. And with that great calling comes great responsibility. Therefore, their sin brings grave consequences. The poems in chapters 3 through 6 repeatedly highlight a few key themes. First, they expose the religious hypocrisy 
of Israel's wealthy and their leaders. Amos describes how they, how they faithfully, faithfully attend religious gatherings, giving offerings and sacrifices, all the while ignoring the poor and ignoring injustice. And Amos says it's all a sham. It's all a farce. It's all meaningless spectacle. God actually hates their worship, Amos says, because it's totally disconnected from how they actually treat people. God says a real relationship with God will transform a person's relationships with other people. Amos famously says true worship is to let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Justice and righteousness are two words that are incredibly important to Amos and all of the prophets. Righteousness, Zedekah in Hebrew, refers to a standard of right and equitable relationships between people, no matter their social differences. Justice, in Hebrew, mishpat, refers to concrete actions you take to correct injustice and create righteousness. Both of these, just, justice and righteousness, are to permeate the life and society of God's covenant people like a rushing stream fills a dry riverbed. In 1 Kings 12, we read how when Israel broke away from Judah, their king built two new temples to rival Solomon's temple in Jerusalem and placed a golden calf in each of them. Since that time, Israel had only accumulated more and more idols, worshiping the gods of sex and weather and war. In the prophet's view, the worship of these gods always leads to injustice because these gods don't require the justice and righteousness demanded by the God of Israel. Not to mention that these gods were immoral themselves, not like the God of Israel. In Amos 5.4, God says, Seek me that you may live. And almost immediately after that, in verse 14, God says, Seek good, not evil, that you may live. So true worship of the Creator God of Israel is synonymous with doing good, with generosity and justice and righteousness. The third and and final theme in chapters 3 through 6 is this. Because Israel and its king have rejected Amos and the other prophets, God will send the day of the Lord. And this is a grave and terrible act of justice that will be invoked upon Israel. Specifically, Amos predicts that a powerful nation will come and conquer and decimate their cities and take the people away into exile. And we know that his prediction came true because 40 years later, the Assyrian Empire did exactly what Amos predicted. Chapters 7 through 9 are a series of visions that Amos has that are symbolic predictions of the day of the Lord. He sees Israel devastated by a locust swarm and then by a scorching fire and then being thrown away like overripe fruit. In a final vision, Amos sees God violently striking the pillars of Israel's idol-filled temple in Bethel and the whole thing come crashing down. It's an image of God's justice on the leaders and the gods of Israel. Their end has finally come. And it's only after all of this then in the last few verses, that we get a glimpse of a new hope-filled vision is described. The words of our scripture passage today. After everything incompatible with God's way is removed, there will be a day of renewal and restoration. All the devastation caused by Israel's sin and God's judgment will be reversed. One way of understanding the book of Amos is to see how it explores the relationship between God's justice and God's mercy. If God is good, 
God has to confront and judge evil and injustice in Israel and the nations. But God's long-term purposes have always been to restore his world through right relationships between all peoples. Now, the blessed assurance that we have is that God wants our lives, our personal lives, our lives of our families, our communities, our country, our world to flourish and to thrive. Because our God is a God of restoration. But the process of restoration requires the removal of everything that is rotted, everything that is rusted, everything that is no longer any good. Now, the easiest thing for us to do right now would be for each of us to think of two or three things other people need to do to experience restoration. Two or three things that other people need to root out of their lives. Two or three things that other people need to get straight with God about. But that would be a sham and a farce. Jesus described it as the height of hypocrisy to spend our days pointing out the specks in other people's eyes, all the while ignoring the log that is wedged in our own eye. Our invitation today is to self-examination and to make a fearless moral inventory both of our personal lives and our common life together. God's promise It's the promise of restoration. And true restoration begins with repentance. Amos' words of judgment sound harsh, but they are true. They sting, but they set us free. They set us free by rousing us from our unconscious acceptance of things that are unacceptable to God. In your personal life, is there something that is incompatible with God, unacceptable to God? Is there something that you need to repent of? Is your life a life of righteousness? Is your life a life of justice? By that, I I mean, are your relationships with all people right and equitable, no matter the social differences between you? What might be some of the concrete changes that need to be made so that all of our relationships, both our interpersonal relationships and our relationships among peoples in our society, are righteous and just? The restoration we desire begins when we ask God to remove everything in our personal lives and in our shared common life that stops justice from rolling down like waters, and righteousness flowing like an ever-flowing stream. Our God is a God of restoration. And that restoration begins in each of our hearts when we humbly repent and commit ourselves to the ways of justice, to the way of righteousness, to the way of Jesus. So today I invite you to join with me in a prayer of confession. You'll see the words on the screen. Pray them with me. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us and forgive us that we might delight in your will and walk in your way to the glory of your name. Amen. God hears our prayers of confession. And when we truly confess, God always forgives. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ and strengthen us in all goodness. By the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. 
the eternal life that is righteousness and justice. Amen and amen. Look at all the broken pieces around me, pieces deep inside my soul. I don't know which real can help the way I'm feeling. All I know is I'm alone. I need a rescue. that you can give toward the mission of Broadmoor. You can go to broadmoormethodist.org slash giving to give safely and securely online. You can text BE MORE to 73256. And of course, you can also mail checks to our physical address at 10230 Molly Lee Drive, Baton Rouge, Louisiana 70815.